welcome to the Mind Money Spectrum podcast, where your hosts, Aaron Ogti and Trisha Patel, go beyond traditional finance questions to help you explore how to use your money to achieve the freedom you want in life. In this episode, Aaron and Trisha discuss concentration risk and when it might be acceptable to take it on. If you have the willingness, ability, and need, increasing your concentration risk may be a way to pursue wealth maximization over the greater probability of achieving a specific goal. But do understand that behavior and emotion can come into play when deciding whether to diversify. Even if you hold a globally diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds, or if you are sitting in cash, you might already have excessive concentration through your place of employment. So in the end, consider employing a robust decision-making process to help you determine the appropriate level of risk that makes sense for your situation. And now, on to our conversation. Hi, my name is Aaron Ogti. I'm a financial advisor in the Bay Area, and I'm here with Trisha Patel, a wealth manager on the East Coast. Hey, Aaron. Great to be here today, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Great to be here as well. The last few weeks, we've been talking about different investing theories, kind of the academic research, how they've been applied, some of the, the history of investment vehicles. And one of the themes that did come up was the benefits of diversification. So Trishel mentioned the idea of reducing the diversifiable risks, the idiosyncratic risks that if you own a single stock, that single stock can go down and do poorly while the rest of the market's doing well. And one of the ways to improve your risk adjusted return is simply by diversifying. If you buy lots of stocks, you'll benefit from general market returns and you have reduced the risk of any one company failing. It's basically don't put all your eggs in one basket. That if you have enough baskets, that even if one drops, you still have enough that you're going to be just fine. But one of the observations that we've made just in conversations and and also in conversations with other advisors, and today we're gonna be examining concentration. So kind of the opposite of diversification. And one of the first observations is, is just empirically, when we look at the wealthiest people or those who have greater net worths, they tend to benefit from concentration specifically. The big names that you'll see in the news, they'll just be founders of companies that have a significant portion of their net worth in the stock of the company they founded. But the strategy has played out to different degrees and different scales for many people. And Today, we want to really examine that concentration, that it, there are benefits to taking on those extra risks. And the idea that while it might not be the best risk adjusted return or the best or the prudent strategy, there are times where concentration might be okay. At the very least, it's not an evil to be stamped out. It's a choice that you have on the general risk return spectrum. So Trisha, when you first think of kind of diversification versus concentration, how would you frame that, whether it's in terms of kind of a client choice or academic research, but kind of is concentration, do you consider it good or bad, but when you think of those two words and how it applies to most people, what are some stories that come to mind? I think what my mind kind of jumps to is the base case, meaning if you have a decision to make, what is your base set of choices? Where do you start from? I think when you're talking about the market in general, you might start from just being in cash, but let's say you've already made that decision to invest your money. Well, at that point, a large part of what we've said before is a good benchmark to kind of attain is just hitting that market return, meaning just instead of picking which stocks to be in, might just pick all of the stocks in the market and then 
basically by the proportion of each stock as it's represented by that size of that stock in the given market. That's what like the S and P 500 does for the top 500 companies in terms of market capitalization in the U S. So that that's kind of like your, your null hypothesis. You just kind of invest in the S and P. And then the question is, okay, can you do better than that by doing something a little different, like picking less than 500 stocks, like a handful of stocks. And that's kind of where my mind goes. That's interesting. And I'm glad you actually brought up the idea of just having that, that base case, because I do think that plays a big factor in clients' decision-making process. And behavioral research has shown this, that kind of that anchoring is really important. It has actually, does have a fairly large effect. Because when I was thinking of concentration, I was thinking of employees who have company stock, where their base case isn't cash and they're choosing to make an investment. Their base case is they're already concentrated. And do they stay concentrated or do they reduce the risk that they take on? And I, I do like the idea of kind of examining that, that where you start definitely matters in that decision-making process because it, I can see if you're sitting in cash, it, it wouldn't be a common strategy to go all the way to that concentrated position, although some people will. And then you get into kind of active versus passive strategies. But if you're already concentrated to move to a diversified position, the framing of the decision feels different. Whereas it with cash, the base case and kind of default is if you do nothing, you're still in cash, which the risks are kind of inflation related, that you're going to be losing value to inflation. But for those who are already concentrated, the base case of just doing nothing is they're staying really, really risky. And the significant risk is their assets go down dramatically. But I do like the idea of kind of starting with that, what is your base case? And then how do you make choices and actions from that? Well, then the high level question I like to generally ask is once we have a base case, then the question is, okay, what's the end goal? What are you trying to do? Are you just trying to turn a profit or are you trying to match the market return or are you just trying to get the most amount of return for the least amount of risk? So these are the types of questions that are kind of sensible to think about. I like that. Well, uh, okay. So what are some of the end goals that you've seen and how would you apply diversification versus concentration? Well, the kind of naive approach when it comes to investing is somebody typically just doesn't want to lose money, but they want more money. But sometimes the thought process just kind of stops there. <laughs> and the tricky part about that is whenever you have money to put to work as an investment, there is an opportunity cost associated with that money if it's not put to work as efficiently as possible. And typically that opportunity cost is not, did you make money or not, but is, did you do as well as you could have? And typically as well as you could have, in my mind at least, is trying to get the highest return for the least amount of risk. And what the evidence kind of suggests is a good way to go about that is trying to match that market return, meaning have a diversified portfolio, spread your bets as widely as possible. We'll talk about why this all may make sense, but th this is kind of what the evidence suggests. If you have a bogey of matching the market, a good way to do that is just invest in a broad index of funds that's diversified and matched to your risk profile. Okay. So when I think of end goals in conversation with clients, it's usually something like I want to be financially independent at some age. It's also the most common retirement, but it could be sooner than that. It could be 
We also see saving for college, saving for a down payment on a house. But I do see these kind of general savings goals. And we've talked in the past how time frame really matters. That if you're saving for a down payment on a house in the next year or two, just leave it in cash. There's no benefit to try and get that upside to take on that risk. It's a kind of the risk is you don't buy the house. Whereas the upside, you, you might get a slightly bigger house, but not dramatically so. You can probably, it's not going to change the ho- type of house you're looking at because your income and mortgage are going to be the more defining factor. So there's little upside and a lot of downside. If it's same for college, you want to, again, risk tolerance and time frame. So divine investment strategy that goes along with how old your child is. And then retirement, financial independence, you have that age. And when I talk about kind of diversification versus concentration with clients, I, I use Monte Carlo simulations a lot. And one of the things I'll point out is if we're trying to be financially independent by a certain age, a diversified strategy helps us reach that goal more effectively. It's a higher probability of achieving that goal and that goal of being financially independent and not running out of money in your lifetime. But a concentrated strategy, again, if they already have a decent amount of company stock, is actually the better wealth maximization strategy. And you see this in Monte Carlo simulations, that if you want to grow your net worth and that is your primary goal, concentration will help that more effectively than diversification. That if your goal isn't necessarily financial independence by a certain age, but it is growing your net worth to improve your lifestyle by multiple degrees, then concentration might be the kind of risk that you're willing to take on. Now, in a Monte Carlo simulation, you have this range of possibilities. And I have to say that the upside is significantly higher with concentration. The downside is also much, much lower. Diversification is actually narrowing our range of possibilities. So it's more likely to achieve that goal, but we are, and it's more likely to achieve that goal because we're reducing that downside risk, but we also are cutting off that upside risk, that upside benefit as well. So usually for those who have a goal of wealth maximization, like genuinely growing their net worth, this is usually where the conversation about concentration, understanding the risk they're taking on in favor of the benefits that they're trying to achieve. So I do like your idea of tying the end goal to how they make this type of decision. Do do you see any other examples of when concentration might be, I'm hesitant to use the word appropriate, but might be acceptable? Well, the, the way I like to think about it when I'm digging into an individual situation as it relates to a client is there are, essentially three important questions we want to balance against each other. You can kind of think about this as like a Venn diagram with like, you know, three circles and like the intersection is your, your target. So, you know, one of the circles is this notion of willingness is a client willing to take on this level of risk. And is this client going to be able to sleep at night by taking on this level of risk? Mm. So that, that's how you can kind of calibrate that. If somebody is used to putting everything on, you know, number seven at the casino on the roulette table, I don't even know if that makes sense. I, it I'm does. You, you got that correct. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say I'm black, but I, I feel like that's not a risky bet. But anyway. But, uh, it's correct. That, that's just a 50-50. Put it on seven is a 36 to one payoff. Okay, so we're, we're in the right ballpark uh, or casino. <laughs> and the notion is if you can't sleep at night, then probably you don't want a concentrated, posi- uh, concentrated position. You want to probably diversify more. But then the second thing 
I encourage clients to think about the second circle in this Venn diagram is, do you actually have the ability to take that risk? Meaning not, can you sleep at night or not, but can your investments handle it? Meaning if you hit a bad patch, you don't want to be out on the street. So that's the second main thing to kind of consider. Just because you're willing to take the risk doesn't mean it's a good idea for your investments because the downside could potentially lead to you getting wiped out. Mm. So that, that's the second big t- thing to think about. And then it kind of brings us to the third circle in this Venn diagram, the notion of need. Do you even need to take on this risk? Meaning you could be willing to do it, you could have the ability to withstand the, the downside, but you might be in a position where you don't need to. You may have accomplished all of your goals or you may be able to accomplish all of your goals without taking on this extra concentration risk. So it's about kind of balancing these three separate concerns to finding a area or gray area within you know, this trifecta spectrum or this Venn diagram that is, that kind of meets a individual situation. So that, that's how I kind of like to think about it. But then I also like to go one more step forward when we talk about the notion of diversification versus concentration specifically. And that kind of leads me to just another one of these general questions, which is why even invest in one thing over another? Like why is one investment more sensible over any other type of investment? And that kind of naively begs the question, well, you'd probably invest in one thing over another if that one thing led to more money over time. But then what we need to also calibrate is just because something leads to more money, you may end up taking more risk in proportion than your alternative choice. So it's this balance of risk and reward that you need to consider. And that's why I kind of led this conversation initially with the notion that ideally a rational investor would want the most amount of return for the least amount of risk so that they can satisfy this kind of Venn diagram of concerns when they put their money to work. And I, I have a bit more about this stuff, but so far, how does this kind of sound? I actually love the idea of that, that Venn diagram. And actually, I wanted to provide a few examples and even go a little farther on that. When I think of, especially for clients who work at companies with, with company stock, one of the common strategies, and at least a common equity compensation plan is with restricted stock units with RSUs. And it's the way the taxes work when they vest that establishes your cost basis, you owe the taxes add to your W2 income. But a really good analogy is if you are holding shares from RSUs after they vested is if you got a cash bonus, you paid the taxes through just normal withholdings, you transferred that money to a brokerage account would you then choose to buy, to use your cash bonus from your employer to buy the stock in your employer? Because for all intents and purposes, the way the taxes work and the way the investment risk works moving forward, that's kind of what vested RSUs and the stock you receive from those vested RSUs look and feel like. And the way you frame the beginning, that what's the base case, what's the default decision that really lines up with that. That the, If you point this out to employees, some would say, yes, I'm very optimistic about the future prospects of my company and I would do that. But for others, it would be like, oh, uh, I, thank you for pointing that out. No, I actually have my salary and my bonus tied up in my company, if the company does poorly, I'm kind of doubling down on my risk. So thank you for pointing out the way of thinking. And so those individuals, once it's pointed out, tend to sell their RSUs as soon as they vest, transfer it to something else, and then use a diversified strategy because it's more in line with that goals. But it is 
I also I do like that again that that Venn diagram because I do think that the sleep at night factor you you described it as willingness, but the ability to understand the risk return respectively, you understand the rewards you're seeking and the risks you're taking on, and you're not getting an ulcer, you're not uh, staying up at night. Like that willingness, I do think is a is a huge factor. I've described the next one as capacity to take on risk that depending on a net worth and income goals, if their net worth is greater than they need, then we could say, okay, you need this much of your net worth to support your lifestyle. You have this extra money that you could take on more risk. That's kind of a, you have the capacity to take on more risk. You could absorb a greater downside without risking your lifestyle. And then the need, it's, it's very similar to that where, this comes up, and this is actually why I like using life planning strategies and conversations with clients that sometimes they just have, I want to make more money. That ends up being their goal. And it requires a little more digging, a little more conversation of, okay, let's say you did make more money. What would you do with it? And the, I, I almost never accept, I want to make more money or, or I want my net worth to be greater as a goal that should just be a means to something else. And that kind of fits in with what you're talking about, that need. And sometimes like, yes, I'd, I'd like to be able to fly first class more often, that if I'm gonna be traveling internationally, that, that's my goal. And as I get older, I wanna be just in a little more, little more comfort. So I wanna make enough money that I can try traveling first class and flying first class internationally. You know eventually when we're allowed to fly again in a post COVID world. But that idea of do they need to take on that additional risk is a really, really good conversation piece. So when you think of the conversation with clients about concentration and that, and that Venn diagram, kind of like the way I described the RSUs, do you have any other ways of framing the concentration versus diversification with clients and like the upside, downside, et cetera? Well, after I've established a kind of better understanding of where a client stands in terms of that Venn diagram across willingness, ability, and need, then I try to understand where a client is in terms of just their ability to desire concentration risk. So if a client is fully on board with a diversified portfolio, then we, we can kind of stop there. But if a client is in favor of a concentrated portfolio, I might just bring up some understanding of kind of just what the evidence says and hope to have a more informed discussion around things like that. And what does, to, the yeah. evidence, what does some of the evidence say? Well, so... To begin, just to add a, a bit more terminology into the context, we, we talked about this notion of wanting to maximize risk-adjusted return, meaning as rational investors, we want the highest amount of return for the least amount of risk. And we might opt for a more concentrated portfolio if we thought it would give us more return with less risk. Ideally, we would want more return and the same level of risk because why not? Mm -hmm. So just to put just some numbers behind it, let's say somebody was really into technology stocks. As we know this year, they've done pretty well. A lot of technology firms have been highlighted because of their ability to allow automation and people from working from home and of course a lot of online shopping. So there's been a lot of synergies there that have been kind of great for an environment where everybody's stuck at home. So let's say we estimated that technology stocks were going to return 10% going forward with a risk of five. Now, the, uh, five doesn't even need to have a unit, but just say, say five, <laughs> five risk, risk units. units. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so your risk adjusted return is 10% over five or two. And let's say we like that because the S&P 500, all of the stocks, including technology, only had a 5% return with a risk unit number of five. 
So then a risk adjusted return of one. So you can see how from this standpoint, technology stocks look to be more attractive. But here's the tricky part. The markets aren't sleeping. Everybody knows that technology stocks have a risk adjusted return of two or they look that much more favorable. What are they going to do? Everybody's going to go out and buy technology stocks. And all of a sudden, what happens? Well, then the prices of tech stocks goes up. In fact, maybe they double. And then if you miss that ride up, what ends up happening is now on a go forward basis, the stock has already doubled. So then the future return is going to be cut in half. So now all of a sudden, instead of expecting a 10% return, you should expect a 5% return with a risk unit number five or a risk adjusted return of one, which is in line with the market. So this is kind of what's happening in the background as investor behavior and market prices are taking effect, such that in theory, you shouldn't be able to predict where your money should go because all of the risk adjusted returns of these various subgroups of the market should automatically be adjusted so that they're all on kind of par with each other. Now there's high level nuances there, but that's the, the big picture of kind of like how efficient markets work in general. Okay. So that, that, that I would say it did sound like our efficient market d discussion that if there's an opportunity to, to get an inefficient return, in this case, the higher risk adjusted return, then everyone would go to that and then all of a sudden that opportunity is no longer there. Yeah, and now just to kind of back it up with the evidence of, for example, professionals who try to follow this strategy, there's been some research based upon data from Morningstar, for example, and what they looked at is how do the actual investor returns compare across these different kind of style categories? Investors who ended up investing in, you know, like technology or commodities or foreign small cap stops or alternative investments and so on, all of these various buckets that are out there. And it turns out across all of these buckets, investors who tried to pick the next best bucket ended up doing worse on average because they got there late to the game. Similar to how a lot of people who might be jumping on the tech bandwagon now might be hoping to do better, but they might actually on average end up doing worse because they missed the boat. So trying to do this type of chasing performance of investing in terms of figuring out what's gonna be the next hot thing on average, according to the data, doesn't lead to better returns. In fact, if you look at professional managers, one thing that you can do is you can ask, okay, what percent of professional managers outperform their benchmark? You know, like outperform the S&P, for example. Well, th those managers that had a outperformance of the S&P, you know, if you look up in your newspaper or wherever you look to get your list of mutual funds, if you look at all those returns and say, okay, does this set of 50 managers follow, try to beat the S&P? Yes, they do. For this 50, what percent actually beat the S&P? Well, it turns out about only 20% ended up beating the S&P if you look in the paper. Or if you- That's you actually lower your... than I expect. Well, here's the, the catch though. The ones that you see in the paper or online are the ones that survived. You don't see the ones that failed so miserably they didn't even make it to the newspaper the next day. <laughs> so the tricky part is once you factor in those dead funds, those ones that weren't good enough to still be around, and you actually incorporate that into the statistic, instead of only 20% doing better, it drops to only about 6%. <laughs> so these are professionals who are trying to figure out, you know, where's the next hottest thing out there? How can I shift my money to there accordingly? How can I make a few concentrated bets and do better than the rest? And they have a 6% chance of actually pulling it off. And 
you may think, oh, great, I'll just find the 6%, but it's not that easy because the 6% that worked aren't even guaranteed to be the, in that 6% group for the next period. In fact, they're probably not going to be. So that there is a very hard game that professionals try to play to try to figure out how to beat the market. And only a small minority do. In fact, it's something we mentioned many episodes ago. This, this feels like um, pre-COVID days. We can kind of use that as our, our PC benchmark. And what we kind of mentioned in that episode is that statistically, some managers have to do well. Statistically, some investors have to do well with concentrated positions. And those are the ones you hear about in the news. But if you add in all of those non-survivors, those ones you don't hear about in the news and you take an average across everybody because you can't will yourself to being the best, you know, that, that might be luck. Well, if you include all of that, it turns out that you don't really see more than you should based upon luck alone. That, that's a, a great point. And I see a similar idea when when I talk to employees that people have made money and actually grown their net worth significantly by holding on to company stock and it rewarded them. I knew someone who worked for Yahoo in the late 90s and through the tech boom, their net worth got up to $10 million. And they held on to their Yahoo stock and so 10 years later, their net worth was, I think, two or $3 million. And now that still was greater than they had been before working for Yahoo. So they still benefited, but it, it hurt them to think that, oh, my, this was my net worth and now I'm down much, much lower for all the stories about the Microsoft millionaires, just employees who held on to Microsoft stock and benefited greatly. You hear those success stories in the news significantly more. The, you hear about all the employees of Google and Amazon and Netflix and Apple and Microsoft and how they have benefited just by holding on to company stock. And they'll almost creates this irrational desire to hold on to company stock and this feeling that it's only going to keep going up. There's definitely a lot of optimism there. and Sometimes it's too much because you don't hear about the stories of the companies who don't go up dramatically. They go down over time where they underperform a comparable investment. You do hear about things like Enron and that's probably the best example of employees investing a significant amount of their net worth in Enron stock and actually failing completely. Now that that's a very rare example, but it's for a company to underperform the market over a decade is a very much more realistic possibility. And it's hard to help people kind of understand that, that like you said, it's that opportunity cost that they would have been better off if they had taken the money out of that company stock and invested in a diversified portfolio. They don't necessarily see that. They, they might see the news of the employees who are significantly wealthier because they stayed concentrated and they don't see that survivorship bias. They don't see the companies that failed or underperformed. And similar, I liked your phrase of, of late to the game that, this already worked. Those employees already benefited. And there's definitely probably some luck there. They just happen to be at the right company and at the right stage. And so they've already benefited. That doesn't mean that your current situation is going to benefit the same moving forward. So in conversations with Netflix employees, they have an options program where for these options to pay off very roughly, they have to get a let's say somewhere between an 11 to 14 percent return over the next per year over the next 10 years and that would be above large cap uh historical averages so it's it's possible 
but that's less likely. So probably something like a, just based on long-term data, a 20 to 40% chance of that happening. But they're looking at their company and they're saying, oh, we've averaged 42% per year for the last decade. For only 14%? Oh, a piece of cake. And it's really hard for them to differentiate that. And that's where that kind of the base case comes into mind. What's their default if they do nothing? How does behavior and emotion impact this? Now, some of these people, they're, they don't have that specific goal for the money. They're, they're on that wealth maximization track. They, they're young enough that they're not looking for uh, financial independence at a certain age. So they're willing to take on that risk. But for others, there are times where it gets too irrational, too overconfident, and it's hard to, again, kind of explain the risks of that concentration. And, and most of the time, it's just having the conversation with them that are they aware of how much risk they're taking on? Are they aware of what are some alternatives? What, what, not not say alternative investment, just what's their other choices? Could they reach their goals more effectively, like in a better risk-adjusted return, like you said, by not using that company stock and not using that concentrated position to having just a diversified S&P 500 ETF, could that be a better way for them to reach their goals? And for some, it's not the case. They, they don't need that S&P 500 return. They're willing to take on the risk that this could go down to zero, that, that this individual company could go bankrupt. Let's say a slightly more realistic is just cut in half. It goes down 90%. We actually, just in the last few months, have seen some companies go down by more than 90% especially things like cruise lines, hotels, a lot of the hospitality and tourism industries. This is a realistic possibility. Other companies have done well, and we don't know what your company is going to look like over the next 10 years. That's where it gets really hard to predict, and that's where understanding the concentration risk is vitally important. If you understand the risk and you still want to take it on, then you can design other strategies. It's usually make sure you're saving enough elsewhere. Usually make sure you're saving enough in your 401k that you can still retire if your company stock doesn't pay off. That's the most common example. But if you have this plan in place and you're willing to take on this risk and you know if this fails or goes down dramatically, I can still live the lifestyle I want, then sometimes that risk is okay taking on because you might be the next Microsoft, Netflix, Google employee who benefits from that growth over the next 10 years. So are there times that you have felt, again, I don't want to say appropriate, but kind of okay or that that it was an acceptable risk for any particular individuals i think it certainly could be it comes down to this notion of position sizing so you have your bread and butter strategy which might make up the bulk of your portfolio but then you could potentially carve out a slice from the pie for gambling or for speculating mm. and it's about calibrating that slice to something that's sensible sometimes you can just throw out a ballpark number like you know five percent ten percent and maybe that that might stick if somebody was trying to go for something higher like 30 40 percent you might tell them you know there's some re some risk here in doing that and the risk that i'm trying to highlight is if you look on an average basis, if you account for the survivors, and if you look at the all-in chances of success of a concentrated portfolio, you're likely going to have a same, if not lower, return for the same amount of risk. Or essentially, your risk-adjusted return is not going to be necessarily higher based upon the evidence for taking on this concentrated portfolio, meaning it's likely going to detract from your overall wealth where you, where you might likely end up. And 
where I try to help also calibrate that is something I've I mentioned way back as well when it comes to these types of decisions is it's a pretty big decision to put even 10% of your net worth into a concentrated position. In fact, if you kind of run a few numbers on the chances of that being successful or you beating the market by a significant amount, chances are you, you'll probably underperform by a percent or so a year for however long you, you plan on doing this endeavor. And if you plan on doing this for like 35, 40, 50 years, well, 1% times 50 years is 50%. You add in some compounding and you're like at 60, 70%, meaning you're 60, 70% less than where you would have been if you had just <laughs> done something simple, like try to match the market rather than try to beat it. That's the difference between, you know, that small slice end up being worth a million dollars if you stuck to a simple plan versus only being worth 300,000. So 700,000 is a pretty expensive hobby. So this, this does kind of talk about like it, it's um, the risk reward. I described this like this range of possibilities, but it almost sounds like we are dealing with a, a non-normal distribution where it's one of those things where there's a 90% chance this strategist is slightly inferior and you're giving up that opportunity, but there's a 10% chance of an outsized return that it makes you a multimillionaire. And I know you can do the math to kind of incorporate that into an expected value and develop a overall, like your net worth, both expected return and your net worth standard deviation based on a non-normal distribution. But it, just thinking in terms of that kind of, I'm okay taking a less risk for that potential outsized return. Where again, it feels almost like buying a lottery ticket. It's like most likely you're not going to win. But if you do, then that could be life-changing money. And I, I do like your idea of that kind of piece of the pie. In conversations I'll have with clients, the we talk about your concentration or your company stock as a percentage of your net worth. So for most people who are not financially independent and they're have some money in company stock moving forward, we want to figure out how much of your net worth should be in this company stock. And conversations usually end up somewhere between like five and 30% with 30% already being really, really risky. And we can use that to help inform investment decisions. So if you've decided that you're, you're comfortable with having 20% of your net worth in your company stock based on other planning, saving for retirement, saving for other goals, et cetera, then if the stock doubles in value, and so now 40% of your net worth is in that company stock, instead of having that feeling like, oh, I should hold on and ride it up, because that's what most people feel, that they don't want to miss out on even further growth, you've already decided in advance, no, we're going to have 20% of our net worth in company stocks, so you're going to sell half of your position. And this actually played out for me and my wife almost exactly. She had company stock in Shutterfly. It was trading in the 40s and 50s. So we decided, okay, how much of our net worth is going to be in this? It jumped up to above 90 based on a company sale they were doing. We ended up selling half her shares. And then a few months later, it was back down into the mid 40s. Eventually, they were taken private at 51. And I've actually written about this on my website, but just that feeling of as you're trying to make decisions in real time, should, like if you, if you look back with retrospect, should we have sold all of her company stock in the 90s? And technically, yes, with, with perfect hindsight, that's what the peak was. But realistically, I don't think anyone was even considering selling all of their stock in the 90s. We had just seen this 
big run up, people like, oh, maybe we can do go even higher and see if this can be really big. But having that plan in place of, okay, we benefited from this big return and we weren't hurt as much by the big drawback. And I really like the idea of thinking when it comes to concentration, what percentage of your net worth do you feel comfortable? What percentage fits that, that three-way Venn diagram, the, the willingness, the capacity, and the need to be invested in a concentrated position? That ends up being the most effective way to find that comfort level of taking on a risk. So are they, can they sleep at night, that willingness? Does it fit with their capacity. So if this doesn't work out, they can still reach the other goals, but then actually making actionable investment decisions as this company stock goes up and down also fits in with that as well. That we're not just hoping for more growth in the future. We actually do have a plan for this money. So have you seen any other strategies or implement anything like that, whether it's that, percentage of your overall pie that you have implemented with clients or yourself? Yeah, I think what you highlighted kind of sums up the high level notion that, yeah, you can think of this as a lottery ticket and then you want to understand how much of your net worth would you put up for speculation. And then should it work out, you have the option to cut, cut back that position to a sensible size. What you're effectively doing is if that pie, that lottery ticket pie gets too big, you pair it back to where it used to be and you allocate that money across the other side of the pizza. And the notion is in theory, you're selling the thing that did better and you're buying the things that didn't do so well. So it's a little counterintuitive, but this is just known as the concept of rebalancing. And over time, it is something that helps keep your risk in line with your preferences, not letting your portfolio get too unbalanced. So that, that's kind of the high level notion, even if you do that between stocks and bonds or across your allocations within your portfolio of concentrated positions versus diversified positions. It's kind of the same concept and it's definitely a sensible way to go about it. I love that phrase of, yeah, while it feels like you are selling the thing you did well and buying the thing that did poorly, the best counter that most people accept is you're selling high and buying low. And if you keep doing these little buy lows, sell highs, that's how you improve your portfolio return over time. It, it might feel hard in the moment of selling the thing that did well, buying the thing that did poorly, but we see enough reversion of the mean, we see this paying off that if you keep thinking, no, I'm gonna keep buying low and selling high, buying low, selling high, that's how you can make more money and see your net worth grow over time. Good stuff, Aaron. Okay. So any other final thoughts that you want to add as we think about concentration? Well, I think this covered a lot of good ground. That just the notion that first we want to calibrate things to where an individual investor kind of stands. And then we want to just have a constructive conversation around what is sensible in terms of what do we know as far as the evidence goes. And then we can kind of take that knowledge and that initial calibration and come up with a game plan that is tailored to an individual. And I think with that, it, it kind of leads to a scenario that at least it's backed by a process where you're more likely to understand the risks you're taking. And given that understanding, you will also uh, have a probably greater chance of success because you're taking risk appropriate to how you feel and your comfort level and how you're able to sustain that risk as well. I like that phrase backed by a process. We should try and use that more often. If, if we keep focusing on developing good processes, the results will eventually follow. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Trishal. I really appreciated our conversation today. 
Thanks, Aaron. I enjoyed it as well. And thanks, everybody, for listening. If you're enjoying these conversations, do continue to subscribe to our podcast and spread the word. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of the Mind Money Spectrum podcast. Be sure to visit mindmoneyspectrum.com to access the entire library of episodes. Remember, it's not black and white, but the wide spectrum of gray area where you get to pursue the freedoms you want in life. Opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical and has no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested in directly. Have a nice day.